Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm Raja Mohan, uh, Director of the Institute for South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. I'm really pleased to uh, host this Ananta Aspen webinar. Uh, they've been doing a lot of the, these webinars on contemporary issues uh, with uh, uh, major interventions in, uh, in the regional and the domestic and the international debates in India. Uh, today's session is on COVID-19 and the new world order. Uh, as you all know that uh, the last three months, uh, the general sense, the world is not going to be the same when we get out of the, the, the uh, envelope that the COVID-19 uh, has created. Whether it is great power relations, nature of economic globalization, uh, the future of the multilateral institutions, uh, and the character of the regional politics uh, all seem to be uh, poised for a big uh, structural shift. Uh, and it's really, the for, there's been talk about the extant world order, the current world order coming to a close. And what uh, the COVID-19 crisis has done is really to, to accelerate the trends that were already visible uh, in the last few years. And, and I think, uh, so that's what we're going to talk about. And uh, uh, to discuss these new trends in the world, uh, we have Ambassador Robert Blackwell uh, with us today. Uh, Ambassador Blackwell does not need an introduction to the Indian audiences. Uh, those, anybody familiar with Indo-US relations uh, will say uh, there was a period before Blackwell and there's been a period after Blackwell. That actually his ambassadorship in Delhi uh, during 2001, 2003 uh, was really a moment when uh, the fundamentals uh, have changed. And I think those who see the new heights of the relationship has reached today uh, will not know how difficult it was two decades ago uh, to get this going, but here we are. Uh, but Ambassador Blackwell is more than a former ambassador to India. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's, uh, he's served in the US administrations uh, in variety of capacities. He's taught uh, and has been part of many leading American universities. And he's currently uh, the Henry Kissinger Senior Fellow at the US Foreign Policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, he's also uh, a distinguished fellow at the uh, Kissinger Center at the Johns Hopkins uh, School of Advanced Studies in, uh, in Washington. Thank you, Ambassador, for joining us today. I know it's very early uh, in Washington. Uh, what we're going to do uh, in the next one hour is really to split this into two. I will have a, a moderated discussion with Ambassador Blackfield for about 30 minutes, and then uh, we will take our question and answers uh, from the audience. So I would say send in your questions uh, into the chat function. Uh, don't wait till the conversation is over. I would say start sending in the questions. Uh, the colleagues at Ananta Aspen will, uh, uh, will, uh, will go through them and send it to me, and I'll try and combine them so that the next 30 minutes uh, we could uh, uh, engage uh, Ambassador Blackpill on the issues that the audience uh, would like to, like to raise. And the talk uh, is based on a report that Ambassador Blackpill has done with Thomas Wright uh, on uh, end of the world order and American foreign policy. Uh, this is really, I think, the, I had good fortune of reading that report in the last few days, and I would certainly recommend to all of you to read it when it comes out uh, in the next uh, couple of days or a little later, because I think it frames the, the big issues of the day uh, quite well, and uh, how the U.S. is going to relate to some of them. So what I'm going to uh, do is, uh, with Ambassador Blackwell, uh, take three different aspects of the report uh, that we have. One is the, uh, you know, uh, Ambassador Blackwell goes into defining the world order, uh, how things have changed under the COVID, and what are the assumptions that have changed, uh, that, that reigned after the uh, end of the Cold War uh, three decades ago, and what are the new goals uh, for the system uh, as we look ahead. So I will deal with that in the first section. Second, we look at some of the recommendations. And third, we look at specifically uh, about uh, the domestic dimensions in US, and then uh, look at India uh, briefly in terms of how the trends that he identifies and are going to uh, affect India-US relations uh, in, the, in the years ahead. So Ambassador, if I might start with you on the, on the first set of questions, uh, how you see the world order, how you defined it, and what has changed uh, with COVID-19, and what ought to be the goals for the future? Well, thank you very much, Raja, and it's... Uh... Wonderful to again be interacting, even though it's from some distance, with uh, all of my uh, Indian friends and other Indians. Uh, 
and uh, it is uh, one of my regrets that this plague has prevented me from making one of my frequent visits to India, but I certainly hope to come again as soon as the conditions permit. I will also say that the report you mentioned, uh, The End of World Order and American Foreign Policy, will be available tomorrow uh, online at the uh, CFR.org, CFR.org. So those of you who want to have a look at it. Now, world order. Uh, that is a term that, of course, is frequently used by folks who write about international relations and policy, almost always without a definition. So uh, uh, Tom Wright from the Brookings Institution and I uh, sought to define the term. And uh, in doing so, we fell back to perhaps uh, the greatest living expert on world order, uh, Henry Kissinger. And let me say how Kissinger defines world order. He began defining it uh, in his first book, A World Restored, about the period after the Napoleonic Wars, and continued all the way up to much more recently in his book, World Order. World order has two conditions. The first is a rough balance of power among the major uh, nations uh, in the world. And the second is uh, what he calls legitimacy, which is a broad agreement among these major powers of uh, the rules of the, of the road. What is permissible and what is not permissible uh, in terms of their actions. So that's uh, what world order is. The condition of world order is uh, stable balance of power and legitimacy agreement among the major powers. It's been rare in human history when there's been such a balance, uh, such a, uh, a world order. Uh, one could say in the period uh, after the Thirty Years' War, again, after the long peace in Europe after the Napoleonic Wars, and more recently, we argue, in the period after the end of the Soviet Union. But finally, on just the term world order, uh, we believe that uh, it began to deteriorate uh, in the early part of this uh, century as uh, nations began to quarrel with the American model of order based on uh, liberal ideas, based on uh, uh, the enlargement of institutions which benefited the United States, uh, based on the notion that uh, sovereignty did not include brutally treating your uh, domestic uh, citizens any way you wished and so forth. That for about 15 years prevail those sets of ideas, but beginning in the uh, early part of this century, especially China and Russia began, began to uh, contend with those ideas to offer a different model of order. And so now, just to conclude this opening uh, uh, definitional uh, segment, there are a variety of concepts of world order. There's the American concept, which one might also call the Western concept of world, of order, of order. There is the Chinese concept of order, which is, as we know, very different uh, from uh, the Western. There's the Russian, which in some ways is slightly different from the Chinese and so forth. I suppose there's an Indian concept of uh, order, international order and its place in it, uh, uh, perhaps uh, consistent with the term strategic ambiguity. But finally, the report argues the reason there's an end to world order, as Kissinger and we define it, is we believe there's no chance that the major powers will reach such an agreement on the rules of the road. Uh, we say that with great sadness but all of the factors that we can find suggest not only is it unlikely that the major powers will reach world order rather, instead of national conceptions of order, 
but in fact, uh, that uh, is getting worse, that the distance uh, between and among the major powers on what should constitute uh, order uh, is uh, getting larger. Raja, I can't hear you. I need to admit, yeah. The, one of the issues that you talk, talked about was sovereignty in this. But we also hear the American president uh, talk about sovereignty. We talk the Europeans talking about strategic autonomy. In some senses, uh, it's not just anymore a West versus the East divide on uh, what ought to be sovereignty. But there is clearly uh, those who think, look, America should take care of itself rather than you know, fixing other people's problems. That's a change, isn't it, I mean, today? Well, I, I would say uh, that uh, it's, it's uh, necessary to distinguish uh, the views of the current American president from uh, the majority views of uh, the United States public and uh, national security experts. Uh, the principal uh, attack on the American concept of international order in the last several years has not been from China, the principal attack. It has not been from Russia. Sure. It has been from the American president who has contested all of the major elements that we knew over decades uh, comprise the American version of uh, order, international order, from uh, a free trading system to uh, uh, support for democrat de democracy around the world to uh, the closest relations with allies and so forth. Uh, he, he has contested all of those. He has some su supporters, millions of Americans who agree with him but uh, a major question uh, going forward is, uh, and of course uh, associated with our election in November, is what concept of international order will emerge from this American election? Because we have two candidates who have quite different views of that. I don't mean to jump to the end, but uh, that is important to note at the beginning that uh, our current president, uh, is uh, uh, the leading revolutionary against the American conception of international order. It's quite fascinating that the hegemonic power seeks to overthrow the system. Uh, but, but It seeks know, to overthrow itself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like a self-denying <laughs> ordinance. Uh, but one of the interest, interesting parts of your report in the first section is really, I know you talk about America can't go back to the liberal international order. You know, all of us in India, all across the world, you know, the LIO was coming through all our years, uh, thanks to our American friends. Uh, but now you say, look, you can't go back to it. And at the same time, you say the future order must be built on freedom and liberty, which are clearly liberal values. So how do you explain this contradiction? Well, the liberal international order is a relatively new term invented by American political scientists Mm. and endorsed by others around the globe. Uh, and uh, the reason that we're not fond of that is that no American has ever heard of it, uh, the liberal international order, and uh, the, uh, therefore there's no public support for it. Uh, so it's a fancified way of saying what America stood for since the end of the Second World War, which is democracy at the core and pluralism and sticking with our friends and uh, containing uh, aggressive uh, actions by the major powers. Uh, so uh, we just don't think that's, that's a helpful phrase. The question of what then, what then, uh, 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 I, I believe myself that what is going to emerge now uh, is a more restrained version of uh, the way America has thought about the world since the end of the Soviet Union. I believe that American policy has been overly militarized in the last 30 years, uh, that uh, we have reached for the gun too soon, 
in a couple of spectacular cases, the 2003 invasion of Iraq, of course, is the most spectacular case of that, but there are others. And I think uh, uh, you will see, I believe, uh, even if uh, President Trump is reelected, uh, more restraint on the part of the United States in its international behavior, uh, and especially if, President, if uh, Vice President Biden is elected, a return to the classic instruments of diplomacy uh, that uh, uh, we have known in earlier periods. Uh, that's, that's my view, and I hope that's not wishful thinking. I did want to say one other thing uh, about uh, your introduction, your generous introduction. Uh, I do not agree that all the trends that we saw before uh, uh, COVID uh, will accelerate. First of all, I do not uh, believe that such predictions, such predictions have an analytical base to them. The, the American baseball player who was famous for his malapropisms, uh, Yogi Berra said, uh, it's dangerous to predict, especially about the future. And uh, I, so uh, uh, I think myself that uh, it may be that uh, the virus, the plague, will produce more cooperation. It will reverse the trend toward the weakening of international institutions, which we've seen, and give a new uh, impulse to strengthen them, driven exactly by the failures of international cooperation with this virus. Um, uh, I, uh, it isn't clear how the United States and China will emerge from uh, this, uh, uh, this virus period, but it may be that China, for example, has uh, substantially damaged its relationship with Europe uh, through its uh, diplomatic behavior there. So that doesn't accelerate the trend of Europe and China moving close to each other and so forth. Uh, I believe it's too early uh, to predict uh, the, uh, uh, the basic outcomes of this period of the virus. So what we content ourselves with is a different set of questions, which is, well, uh, what, was it, uh, what was order like before the virus? What is it like during the virus? And then what should the United States in particular do to deal with the post-virus situation? But if you don't like uh, that approach, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of predictors all across uh, the internet uh, who are much more bold and confident in their predictions uh, than I believe is warranted. That brings me, I think, uh, to the second part, which is really three aspects I want you to do on your recommendations to. One is about globalization, multilateralism. Second is on the great power relations. And third is on the regions. So maybe we can cover all the three, uh, you know, quickly. Good. Well, do you want me to? You want me to start then with? No, so we can uh, start with uh, no globalization and multilateralism. Good. I will start there. Well, let me say, uh, I do think uh, that uh, the the economic uh, consequences of uh, the virus, and just to give uh, your audience uh, uh, some or our audience some sense of this, there are now 36 million Americans who have lost their jobs. Uh, because in three months, uh, uh, much worse than the Great Depression in the 1930s in the United States. I do think that uh, more autonomous economic activity uh, will be attempted by every country and certainly the major powers, but there will be severe limits to that in a globalized world, uh, even though uh, some talk about uh, making uh, all supply change indigenous to the United States, that of course is absolutely preposterous. So uh, I do think there'll be some attempt, but it will be, it will have marginal effects. On the uh, international institutions, well, that remains to be seen. If I can uh, 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 describe a, a particularly American uh, perspective, the United States, has generally seen international institutions 
certainly in the last half century, as at the margin of its foreign policies and uh, international behavior. It, ha it has supported, of course, the United Nations, but when it didn't like the, uh, the Security Council's uh, view of its actions, it went ahead anyway. Uh, and the same is true in a variety of other, not, not so much the World Bank and the IMF, but the political. I think now the United States, because of the rise of China, uh, uh, needs uh, strong international institutions in a way it never did before. And we'll see if it uh, acts in that way, uh, uh, consistent with that proposition. Uh, then finally, uh, uh, a nation that has recognized, I believe, that international institutions will have an increasing uh, part and influence on the international system is China. And for the last five to seven years, at least, and perhaps longer, it has worked very hard to strengthen its position in uh, the various UN agencies. Of course, there's a controversy now is, uh, has it done so at the expense of objectivity in the WHO? But that's just one example, <clears throat> excuse me, of the systematic Chinese effort uh, to uh, strengthen its uh, position in these international organizations at the expense of uh, the values of uh, Western order at the expense of human rights, at the expense of, uh, of, uh, of uh, human uh, governance, human, humanist governance, and so forth. If the United States and the West do not respond now, having seen this occur, most dramatic example is the WHO, we will have international institutions which are essentially driven by Chinese authoritarian models. And of course, I believe that would be bad for the United States, bad for India, bad for all countries who have uh, democratic preferences. One of the, that takes us to China straight away, the great power relations, where your report is quite explicit, uh, put simply, compete with China. And at the same time, you're also saying, you know, insulate the transnational cooperation because you'll still need China to deal with global issues. So is there a tension between these two notions? Compete with China, but at the same time, ring fence uh, a set of issues. Uh, will it work? Yes, there is a tension, absolutely. And it will be uh, difficult to implement. Um, it's, it's one of those prescriptions which is easier to state than to make real. Uh, there are three elements in the report about US-China relations and China more broadly in the international system that the United States needs to do. The first is, the first is to uh, uh, stop the deterioration of the balance of power uh, between the United States and China. <clears throat> the second is uh, to, uh, and excuse me, I'm going to, uh, Clear my throat here, if I may. Uh, I'm not. I'm not making an advertisement for Coca-Cola. So the um, the second is uh, uh, to uh, uh, be sure uh, that uh, diplomacy is an instrument uh, of our approach uh, to China, and uh, uh, in my view, that's not the case now. Uh, and then the third is uh, to uh, work with the Chinese on these big issues. And uh, for your audience who doesn't follow this uh, on a daily basis, the US-China relationship is in serious long-term and dangerous decline. And if it continues and evolves into a permanent confrontation, all countries in the world will be negatively affected by that. And so there's a, there are big stakes, of course, for the people of the United States and China, but also uh, for the people of India and the world if the current uh, trends toward greater and greater hostility uh, uh, continue. Uh, it's now become an issue of domestic politics in both countries with uh, the Chinese leadership 
using uh, the confrontation between the United States and China domestically to increase uh, support for its policies. And of course, uh, President Trump has made it a major campaign issue, asserting that Vice President Biden has been soft on China. This is a man who continually uh, says uh, how much he admires the Chinese president, but put that aside. So, Roger, this is really dangerous. Uh, one last overarching strategic point up your alley, which is, I do not believe now that the United States can successfully compete with China over the long term by itself. It needs its alliances in Europe and in Asia. It needs friendly democracies, especially India, but others. Uh, and the idea that the United States, as it could for the decades of most of the Cold War, uh, uh, guard its national interests and its values by itself is simply no longer true. China is too powerful for that. And that brings me to, you know, the regional side. I mean, it's quite interesting that you say, look, forget Middle East and focus on Asia is my words. I'm summarizing because we've seen so much of you in the Middle East, uh, but there are a lot of resistance within the U.S. It's often talked about moving out of Middle East to focus on Asia. Uh, is, where do you see this going? But it's quite interesting. You put it uh, quite starkly, time to leave Middle East and time to project power into Asia. Well, it, it, if I may say, it wasn't leave as if you pack all your bags and go out the door and say, uh, see you later, never. But it is reduce our involvement in the Middle East. And uh, that has a military dimension, which is moving forces from the Middle East. But more important, uh, it, is, it is the time that American policymakers spend uh, on the Middle East. I've worked for five American presidents, so I have a pretty good sense uh, of, uh, of uh, this issue. And American uh, uh, presidents and policymakers since the 1967 war in the Middle East have spent enormous amounts of time on the Middle East, diplomatic time. And it's as true uh, in the Indian government as uh, in the US government, the most valuable resource is the time of the policymakers. And what we're saying in the report is uh, reduce the time that U.S. policymakers uh, uh, spend on Middle East issues. And just to be slightly more specific, uh, the two-state solution for the Middle East is dead. Uh, Israeli policies, I believe, have made it dead. Uh, uh, a, uh, in the past, we could have expected the new administration, uh, whether it's Trump or Biden, to launch a major Middle East initiative to try to deal with this. Well, uh, that would be a mistake. And that's only one example of, uh, of just a reduced involvement in the region uh, and an increased involvement uh, in uh, uh, Asia. Every time I see Mike Pompeo getting on an airplane and flying to the Middle East, I want him instead to get on an airplane and keep going to Asia. Uh, and uh, uh, I hope that as we uh, get past our election, that will kind of become more and more of the, uh, of the mainstream. So before we run out of the time for your initial uh, part of the conversation, uh, of course, uh, when, with you writing the report, I mean, we certainly expect you will say something on India. There is a clear recommendation that the U.S. should step up with, with India. Uh, of course, last many years have seen significant advance. What more do you see the administration ought to be doing vis-a-vis -vis India? Well, uh, it's mostly on the military side uh, because uh, under our current president, of course, India is quite cautious in how much it supports American policies on any given afternoon because they might be different the following morning. And by the way, it's not unique in uh, that uh, cautious approach to American uh, foreign policy. Uh, but I hope, I hope 
that uh, in the period ahead, we will have a more consistent and coherent foreign policy, not a policy by tweet, but a policy by uh, considered and uh, uh, reflected uh, uh, views. And uh, I hope we will intensify our diplomatic interaction uh, with India. But what I have most in mind is military cooperation. The United States uh, continues uh, to have uh, bureaucratic obstacles to uh, intensifying defense cooperation with India, and they should be removed at this point. Uh, 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 Ashley Tellis, our friend and I, have written uh, in Foreign Affairs magazine elsewhere that it's a mistake to for Americans to talk uh, about India becoming an American ally and all that. Uh, that isn't going to happen. But uh, we can grow closer together in dealing with what I believe both governments uh, recognize, which is the major challenge for our well-being in the foreseeable future is the rise of Chinese power. And we need uh, a strategy agreed to uh, by India and the United States and the democracies around the world to deal with this which is consistent with what I said before, repair the, the deteriorating balance of power, uh, 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 engage with China, but compete with it. And then finally, uh, as, uh, as we said, uh, work with China on uh, major international issues. We all ought to be working together in a, a loose uh, uh, confederation of uh, democracies. Uh, and uh, now we are not. Well, you know, we'll, I'm sure there are a lot of questions on India, uh, but for the but before that, before we close the first segment, uh, it's really how do you situate your where do you situate your report in the domestic debate? Because U.S. is very polarized, uh, the deep divisions, and even within the Democratic Party, while the party has rallied around Biden, there are progressives, there are conservatives, there are you know isolationists. I mean, it's quite a the leftists now. Uh, so uh, it's really, uh, where do you locate this, uh, your report, your broad, uh, in terms of the spectrum in the U.S.? Well, we uh, have managed, I believe, to offend uh, both sides. So the progressive Democrats uh, will not like uh, many of them. I don't want to say every one of them, but many of them will not like our emphasis that China is seeking to replace the United States as the most uh, important and, uh, and uh, decisive power in Asia. Uh, and uh, those on the right will not like our emphasis on international institutions and alliances uh, and climate change and so forth. Uh, uh, what uh, these, these views are our own, we didn't seek to bend any particular direction uh, in expressing them. But we hope once the election campaign is over, and as you know, uh, 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 one pundit once said, no serious issue can be discussed profitably during an American inter uh, election campaign. Uh, that may be a slight exaggeration, but in any case, the report uh, uh, I think will not be seriously, uh, uh, and this is fine, uh, uh, examined until after our election. And we hope, we hope that the new administration will look at it and find at least something sensible about it, and at least have it as a basis of discussion, along with, uh, of course, other efforts by others. Since one of our, you know, your former colleagues and my friend uh, Don Camp has just uh, you know, joined the question answer, he, so he, he's just uh, telling us about Trump's tweet. Trump has just tweeted a little while ago saying that uh, U.S. has informed India and China that the U.S. is ready, willing, and able to mediate and arbitrate between India and China uh, in the raging border disputes. You are always against mediations. So what, what, do you, what do you think of this? Uh, it's uh, not serious. It's not worth spending any time discussing, if I may say, in our limited time. It's obviously, uh, uh, well, <laughs> it's just not worth spending time on. 
So I have a colleague from Singapore, uh, Ravi Bellor, who used to cover, you know, used to be in Delhi, he works for Straits Times. I mean, he's asking, you know, you talked about India-US trade flat as a chapati into back in right. 2001, 2002, but today it's a $160 billion relationship. I mean, I think right. it's quite expansive today, but yet uh, the trade disputes have never been as bad as they are today. So how do you explain this contradiction? Well, it's hard to, yeah, let me just say again, with this president, it's hard to separate his rhetoric from his actions. So if you just look at his rhetoric, you would say there must be a crisis in U.S.-India relations because of his unhappiness with uh, Indian trade policy. But there is no such crisis in our policy because as with many other things, he, he tweets and he has offhanded comments in a press conference if he's asked, but there's no systematic follow-up and, or usually not. Now, uh, uh, there is obviously unhappiness in the United States about many of the tariff policies of uh, India. And this is hardly new <laughs> on the US-India uh, uh, bilateral agenda. And as you said, uh, actually, if you look, take a longer view of the last 10 years, uh, India has made some substantial progress in that regard. But this is not going to be, uh, these are not going to be issues that are going to be solved through Twitter attacks and through offhanded comments. Uh, I don't expect any serious work to be done on it this year for reasons I've said earlier, but we can return to the subject. I, I'll make one broader point. Uh, in the United States, uh, one of the uh, strongest advocates for U.S.-China relations uh, 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 in the last 30 years has been uh, American businesses who wanted to uh, uh, make uh, uh, money uh, investing and building uh, facilities in China. That is now quite uh, remarkably and dramatically changed. And uh, I think there's a real opportunity here to substantially increase US foreign investment in India, FDI, foreign direct investment, uh, because of this uh, concern in American business about the direction of US-China relations and what might happen to their investment in China if there's a permanent confrontation between the two countries. So I believe that is a major opportunity uh, for India, but they will have to relax, at least to some degree, uh, more of their tariff barriers in order to make that happen. Thanks, thanks for that, because one of the questions was about the US companies uh, moving out of China to different other places. Uh, but uh, there's another question, you know, which you kind of referred to that India is never going to be an ally of the United States. So the question is, look, uh, is, there, uh, so is, there, is there going to be a treaty relationship between India and US? Why do you think uh, India is never going to be an ally? I mean, this is the kind of most Indians would not ask this question, but uh, why is it? Because if India is under pressure from China, uh, that makes sense to, we might not call it alliance, but do more things together. Well, uh, uh, Henry Kissinger a while back said, US-Russia policy would make sense if Russia had no history. <laughs> and I would say the idea that India will become a treaty ally of the United States would make sense if India had no history. Uh, it is, uh, uh, it seems to me, uh, uh, highly unlikely that uh, India having finally shaken uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, separated itself from a group of white males uh, thousands of miles away telling it what to do uh, as Americans too are uh, inclined to do uh, is highly uh, unlikely. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that the two countries can't become uh, strategically closer and closer together. I think they can, and they should because of the rise of Chinese power. They should uh, 
uh, have a broad agreed strategic approach to China. And this is, gives me the opportunity to, to make another point in the report. The United States in the period ahead has to take the views of its allies and friends more seriously uh, uh, than it has when it was at the preeminence of its power. And therefore, listening to our Indian uh, colleagues in government about how they see best dealing with the rise of Chinese power will be something of an unnatural act for Americans to listen carefully to what others think uh, before acting. But it's necessary in the period ahead in the way that it has not been in the post-war period. There is a flip side to the question, which Indians uh, probably don't see enough of the US domestic politics. It's not whether one thing is for India to look for an alliance, but what we've seen in the US in the last decade and more, the US is no longer willing to take alliances. Actually, US is wants to, there's a whole strong school today, retrench, shed your burden, uh, more burden sharing, rather than US saying, look, uh, we're looking for anybody who wants to join us in a treaty. So it's actually, uh, the, the demand side is one thing. The supply side has actually weakened. Right. Yeah, I think that's right in general. Uh, however, I do want to say India is very popular in the United States. It continues to be uh, admired uh, by uh, Americans uh, in the polling. Uh, only behind Canada uh, is in the last poll I saw. Uh, and uh, that's also uh, true because of the extraordinary success of Indian Americans who are, as a group, uh, the most affluent, the most law-abiding, uh, the most uh, societal, societal responsible, and so forth in our, in our country. I don't know what would happen. Let's imagine for a moment a future, just to finish this topic off, in which the United States and India decide they want to have a treaty uh, alliance, and it's introduced as it would have to be in the US Congress, in the Senate, where it would have to have a two thirds majority. I think there would be a decent chance it would get a two thirds majority, uh, both because Americans admire India, because of the rise of Chinese power, uh, and because uh, Indian Americans are major contributors to American political campaigns, I which see. also yeah. which also affects how legislators uh, decide. Uh, but that's never going to happen. As I say, uh, I do not believe, remember I said it if, it, uh, if I'm wrong, that Indian history and political culture, its sense of itself, uh, will ever lead it to want to join a formal alliance with the United States. No, just too big to be a junior partner for, uh, for anyone. Right. But that takes me to the next question. It is on something on, on, is China's BRI like what Marshall Plan did to US-Europe relations? So is, China, is BRI a strategic economic instrument? I know that your last book was really on economic diplomacy and how the US has forgotten and here. So what, what do you say about BRI and uh, what do you think the US might do to deal with it? Well, uh, I don't want to say that uh, uh, BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, is only a coercive instrument for China's geopolitical objectives, but it is certainly that. It is certainly that. Um, uh, those who say, oh no, oh no, it's entirely economic in nature, just hasn't been following it carefully because the Chinese are using it uh, to, uh, to loan large uh, amounts of money in order to acquire strategic assets and the country in question can't pay back the loan and so forth. Uh, but I also think that in some cases, uh, it can improve the infrastructure of nations, uh, of recipient nations, but it just needs to be a lot more transparent than it is, because as you know, it's not transparent at all. And uh, it needs to be looked at carefully uh, by uh, the international community. One way to start would be for it to adopt the, the practices of the World Bank in how it deals with potential 
uh, potential uh, projects and uh, lending to such projects. And of course, it doesn't do that. So now, can the United States compete with China in sums of money? Of course it can't, and it shouldn't try, but it should keep pressing uh, China to be, for, the, for it to be more transparent in this regard, and it should cooperate with our friends and allies around the world to increase the quality of our aid to the developing world. We need to transfer, transfer for more resources to the developing world than we're currently doing, including Africa. And let me just say, again, we do not yet know what the strategic consequences of the virus will be in Africa, because it is just beginning to uh, unfold in the tragic ways it does on that continent. But it could so dislocate uh, African governments that we could have uh, border changes and we could have coup d'etats and we could have mass violence and we could have migrations uh, across borders and so forth. Uh, and uh, again, in the post-plague uh, uh, situation, beginning now, uh, uh, the international community, all of it, United States, its allies and friends, China, all countries should be coming together to figure out how they can help uh, uh, the developing world to deal with this plague, since it has, we know, inadequate governance, inadequate resources, inadequate medical facilities, inadequate testing, and one can go on. So one of the questions uh, from, I see Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, I mean, asking you, how do the rest of the world deal with the U.S. that is not predictable? I mean, that what we've seen, I think the U.S. acquired the dominance after the, you know, in 1990. But then you saw different groups in Washington, the, shall we say the warlords of uh, Beltway, uh, fighting over ideas. And uh, it really it didn't seem to matter what was happening on the ground. It was really testing out different uh, competing ideas, how best to use American power. So it's really, you mentioned it in your, in your talk. I mean, it's really difficult for others like we had in this beginning of this administration, you come and say, look, uh, stop relationship with North Korea and you know, pull on your embassy. Now, six, six months later, you come and say, we love Kim Jong-un. So, so I think it's, it's a structural problem, is it? I know your report actually says, look, it must be more predictable. So you reflect on that. Well, um, you started by asking, uh, how should other countries deal with uh, the... Uh, uh, the uh, unpredictability of American foreign policy. It does remind me of that old line of how to how do porcupines make love? And the answer is carefully. Uh, the, the countries uh, that have to deal with an administration and a president that is so unpredictable and so driven by this morning uh, and whatever he watches on television. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the simplest answer to that is no long-term policy based on American uh, national security consistency. In the current situation, I think it would be foolhardy for any country dealing with the United States to say, we're making a long-term bet that American policy will be X with this president, because I believe there's no evidentiary basis to make that judgment. So what that means, of course, is countries are careful and cautious and lots of miss, missed opportunities uh, prevail, lots of missed opportunities. And the, that brings me to this interesting question on the Middle East, uh, that you know, Turkey is supposed to be your ally, uh, uh, but, you know, U.S. and Turkey are at odds. Uh, something similar is happening in East Asia as well. Uh, two oldest uh, alliances of the U.S., Philippines and Thailand, uh, today are no longer, you know, in any meaningful sense, uh, follow the U.S. lead. So it's really the whole structure of U.S. alliances in the Middle East and Far East. So you think this can be fixed or we really 
there's going to be significant alignment, realignment, dealignment that will take place as the U.S. adjusts uh, its position in the global affairs. Let's do Turkey first. And you're absolutely right. Turkey is now an autocracy and uh, does not meet uh, the democratic standards of the North Atlantic Alliance, of which it is a member. Uh, however, I don't believe that the United States should principally pursue its relationship with Turkey bilaterally. This should be done through NATO with our European allies and uh, 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 work with uh, Erdogan, the leader of Turkey, as much as we can. But what's happened to Turkey in the last 15 years is alarming. It is alarming. Um, but even if Turkey decides in practice or uh, in uh, treaty fact to withdraw from NATO, that, uh, that would be regrettable, but that's not the end of the NATO alliance. It's not the end of the transatlantic alliance between the United States and the European Union and so forth. So, so be regrettable, but it's not at the heart of U.S. European policy. Uh, on um, Philippines, uh, Philippines. Uh, yeah, the, there we just need more active American diplomacy. Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, now I'm not saying that's uh, that's a simple uh, solution, but uh, working problems uh, day by day by day. I started my government career with Henry Kissinger, and what's often not remarked about him was his assiduous working of a problem every day, every day, every day. The same was true of George Shultz. The same was true of Jim Baker, every day, every day. Our current Secretary of State seems primarily interested in his place in U.S. domestic politics. And uh, uh, he is not working problems every day, every day, every day that have anything to do with our international uh, prestige and vocation. So I would say back to the traditional hard work of diplomacy, including on the issue you mentioned. Uh, American leadership, I hope that's not too controversial a phrase for our Indian audience, but American leadership is necessary. Madeline Albright got into trouble by saying America is the uh, indispensable nation. Well, as a certain, I, I really like Madeline, she's a friend, but I think that was a little bit over the top to say it, even if you thought it. But certainly American diplomatic reach uh, is uh, possible to help such uh, issues as the one you just mentioned, and it essentially doesn't exist now. One question from Nikhil about Gude. Uh, it's really, you know, about large corporations. I think one of the trends we've seen in the world is really the rise of Google, Facebook, Amazon. Now we're seeing similar companies come out of China, uh, Tencent, WeChat. Now, how do they relate to the geopolitics we, you know, we generally been focusing on? Like even your report, at some point, people would want Amazon to pay taxes somewhere. The French uh, are going at them, you know, everyone is trying to. So, are these corporations autonomous from U.S. policy? Because in the end, they're really American companies, right? I mean, so the Americans want them under better control. The rest of the world wants them to be accountable. How do you see this playing out? Well, again, it's, it's uncertain. Uh, there is growing concern in the United States about the uh, effects of some of these comp uh, uh, companies on American privacy. And this has been accelerated in, in uh, recent years. But these are private companies in our system. Uh, uh, our government and our president sometimes tries to, to do this, but our government uh, does not have the constitutional right to tell private companies what to do. That's China. That is not the United States. So uh, I think that uh, American governance on the issue will be driven uh, by uh, two things. One is, uh, as I said, concerns about privacy in particular, but the second is Americans like these uh, functions. They find these functions improve their lives. Uh, and so uh, I would expect them to be around 
uh, for uh, the foreseeable future, whether there'll be some more constraints, self-denying ordinances. That is to say, Facebook is much more rigorous in uh, deleting uh, items that are untrue or are racist or so forth may happen, may happen. But as we know, that line between provocation and racism, for example, can be pretty blurry. But mostly this will be done in the private sector on the basis of uh, the American views, uh, which reflect itself in its stock prices and all the rest. The three questions on China, and I think uh, I must apologize to the rest uh, because we're beginning to run against the clock. One from Shubhamai Bhattacharji is, is really uh, about the politics in both the countries, like in India and the US. When the US says we want to be friends with India, somebody gets upset in India, uh, or when the US is doing too much with you know India, there of course uh, the US divisions in terms of should we really oppose the Chinese, uh, should we support the Indians. So given the deep divisions on China within the U.S. itself, uh, the, the system... I, I have to correct you, uh, I may misunderstood. There are not deep divisions in the United States about China. By the way, I regard that as unfortunate because <laughs> there's now a near consensus in the United States that a U.S. policy toward China should be in the form of a comprehensive indictment of China. And if you see both sides of the aisle from Nancy Pelosi uh, to Mitch McConnell, uh, there's no suggestion about the dangers of permanent confrontation with China. And there's no suggestion about uh, diplomacy as a role uh, in uh, avoiding permanent confrontation, confrontation. and uh, if, the, if your reader, if your viewers haven't had a chance to look at it, there's a recent uh, 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 earlier this week, last week, about U.S. strategy toward China, which has the presidential seal in the upper left-hand corner, so it's released from the White House. It's very long, and it is entirely an indictment of China. And it's only in one sentence in the last paragraph that it says, oh yes, well, we should try to work with China on, is on generally uh, uh, issues that concern us both. Uh, uh, that flies in the face of what diplomacy is supposed to do. Diplomacy is supposed to be an instrument to resolve disagreements and indictments are not instruments to resolve uh, disagreements. And now we have a situation where both governments trade only indictments. So there is one question on the economic side, which uh, you know, tests your proposition. Uh, the US political class might be agreed, but if you look at uh, uh, Wall Street, if you look at Silicon Valley, and the financial sector, there's so much of interdependence. So Shakti Sina is asking, can you really decouple? Is it really possible, given such powerful forces in the US saying, look, we shouldn't abandon, or we can't decouple, so let's manage this? No, we cannot decouple. Uh, we can, at the margin, to some degree, uh, uh, reduce our dependence on some uh, products uh, or uh, natural resources that come from China, we can. But people who talk about decoupling these enormous economies and their, uh, uh, their inner uh, twined uh, connections with one another, it's impossible. So there's one question on, on Quad, uh, which is Mr. Agarwal is asking that. So you really, I mean, you know, this is an innovation of a recent uh, since you you see it's working or is it really a band-aid given the Chinese power at this point of time? It's, it is uh, better than nothing, <laughs> I guess I would say, but it's largely a, uh, 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 a uh, initiative which is still uh, in its cradle, if I may put it like that. And it has lots of potential, lots of potential. But if I can return to an earlier question uh, you asked, good question, which is, well, if you were one of the other members of the Quad, 
would you like to depend on the United States having its same position on any particular issue uh, next year, not to say next week, and then say, let's really work the Quad harder. The Quad uh, awaits a consistent and uh, sensible and uh, broadly discussed policy toward China to be exploited. But it's there to be exploited, but it isn't going to happen this calendar year. So before we close, I mean, I just want to ask you, you know, as you said, U.S. is in the middle of an election, uh, even without a campaign, the COVID has affected it uh, very deeply. But yet, uh, given what you've seen in the, in the you know, we know, you know, we've dealt with Trump in the last three years, uh, there's not much contestation that side, but within the Democrats was a deep division. So if Biden comes to power, uh, how would you kind of, not predict, but broadly given what you heard from his, and Tom Wright himself has been writing about it, so. Right, he has been, and I commend everybody to look at his uh, columns uh, in the Atlantic, because uh, they're among the best that are being written about uh, foreign policy and the intersection with domestic politics. Here's what I think, and these, a lot of these, uh, the senior Biden people are friends of mine, I've known them for a long time, and they're a capable lot by and large. Uh, during the process before the election, uh, Vice, Vice President Biden, of course, is going to have to take into account the views of the more progressive parts of the Democratic Party. And that, that will be a really tough negotiation on the platform of the Democratic Party, including on issues like Israel. Uh, however, I think that once if he is elected and he puts uh, people in office like uh, Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan, these people who were with him, have been with him before, and I could name 10 others. Uh, what I think you'll have is a return to uh, a broad set of principles about American foreign policy that we've seen for decades uh, with the, uh, with the proviso, the caveat, that America is going to be more restrained militarily in the future. There's no domestic uh, support for it. A much greater reliance on diplomacy uh, than uh, certainly the current administration. A much uh, greater commitment to our alliances uh, than in the current administration. But there is broadly, having said all that, unhappiness uh, across uh, the political spectrum in both parties about uh, America's trading arrangements around the world. And if you listen to Nancy Pelosi, she's as critical, for example, about European barriers to American uh, trade as is uh, the Trump administration. So definitely uh, that will be a major theme. Uh, and then finally is the point, we said it before, uh, it's one thing to return to the principles of American foreign policy as they've been reflected over decades. We don't know how competent the administration will be because in the end, what matters is day-to-day competence in a strategic framework. And we've seen that before in American foreign policy, beginning, I think, all the way uh, to Dean Acheson at the uh, uh, period after the Second World War through uh, great secretaries of state who I mentioned earlier. We'll see how competent these people are in dealing with uh, the uh, enormous challenges of the international system. Thank you, Ambassador. I think we've really run out of time. I want to uh, thank all the participants who asked questions, and I'm sorry we couldn't channel all of them because there were so many of them, but I thought we covered quite a bit of ground. And I want to thank you, Ambassador Blackwell, for uh, your uh, usual scintillating uh, you know, uh, answers to uh, what is a, a very complex uh, situation in the United States because I don't think we pay enough attention in India, and even in Asia, where I'm now living in East Asia, uh, to the U.S. domestic politics. So I think some of the insights that you gave that a U.S. that is, you know, arguing itself, arguing with itself, talking to itself. So we look forward to engaging with you in the next six months. There is 
a lot of excitement. And uh, given the changes that are taking place in the world, what the US does, whether it is predictable or not, has consequences. And I think that all of us have to deal with it in the rest of the world. But we look forward to staying in touch with you and to uh, engage with you on the changes uh, that are taking place in the world and how the US is going to respond to them. So please join well, me. Thank you very much, Raja. And let me just say, it's been a delight to interact with you and thank all of the viewers uh, for uh, listening and everybody stay safe. Take care, good night. Good, night. good morning. Yeah. And good morning.